Karen, let's start right at the beginning. You know, your first inspiration or opportunity to become a dancer, how did it all happen? Uh, Ironically, it was because of Celia Franca. Mm -hmm. Celia Franca, who founded the National Ballet of Canada in 19... 63 19... years ago? Or was uh, 63 now? Almost 63 years yeah. ago, mm -hmm. yes. And um, I believe it was my eighth birthday that my parents took me to the ballet because I wanted to see one in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. We lived in Ancaster. We went in and we saw it, and Celia Franca was dancing Giselle, and I said, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I started ballet lessons, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have teachers in Ancaster who recognized that I had a kind of ability that I should be sent to a professional school. My parents had never heard of Canada's National Ballet School. We didn't know it. I didn't know it. Um, but I was sent there, and I got in there, and I had scholarships for much, much of it because my parents had four kids to raise, <laughs> and they couldn't afford it. Um, so. It was serendipity. It was good luck. It was hard work. It was hard work, but if you don't, as a ballet dancer, if you don't have the opportunity to train at the right age, uh, you won't be able to have a career in ballet. Right. Do you ever see, you know, you hear about acting, talent agents like finding models, right? 12 year olds, here's my card, honey, phone me. Do you mm -hmm. ever see people out there in the world and think, that, that could be a dancer right there? You know, I do. Huh. But Many times you can have what you think are all the essential ingredients to be a wonderful ballet performer, and there'll be one ingredient missing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just the determination that's missing. Mm -hmm. You can have all the physical talent, you can have had good training, and then it doesn't mean much to you right. if you don't care. And there are many people who are less talented who care much more deeply and have better careers. Mm -hmm. so. it, it, we're we're in the middle of the Olympics right now, right? And the, the whole idea about faster, higher, and people are setting and breaking world records every day. Mm -hmm. Does the same thing happen with dance? Are the, are the young people better, higher, are, are they different? Uh, the physical prowess is extraordinary now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the world we live in, and ballet has become a much more international art form. Uh, we see um, how people dance all over the world and everybody tries to, I mean, it is kind of like the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I feel when the National Ballet of Canada goes into yet another season, we have four every year, um, it's like we're all going to the Olympics. I mean, mm -hmm. I only sit and watch and root for them, but the training that they do, the, the sacrifices they make, the determination they have to, to dance at their very best um, and compete with the best in the world, uh, is the same. Um, but, you know, I, I, I keep hearing all these uh, Olympic athletes being interviewed after they've won their second gold or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic, and they're saying, I'm giving it up now. I can't, I can't sacrifice my whole life and train like this for, an, mm -hmm. for another four years. I just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And ballet dancers, many of them just keep doing it and doing it and finding the will because it is kind of an addiction, I think, being a performing artist and testing yourself against amazing roles and testing yourself against the past and, and discovering the future with the new choreographers and um, trying to make your body succumb to your, to your will, to, mm -hmm. to keep going, to have the stamina, to have the strength, uh, to have better characterizations. To, you know, it, it, there's always something, there's always a goal they have. It's interesting because if you compare uh, different types of athleticism, you know, NHL hockey players making $20 million a year and, you know, the figure skating that you see in the Olympics, it, they get their own TV shows, everyone's glued, and yet I see precisely the same, as you said, determination, athleticism, and yet it's not held in the same world somehow. What's the gap there? Well, I guess it's, um, I guess sports is, it's more... Um, Competitive? Mm -hmm. We should have cards going, that was a 10, that jeté was a 10. Yeah, and more commercial. <laughs> right. And more accessible to people to understand. Sometimes the art form of ballet is a little more complicated. And the efforts are uh, sometimes not as evident because it's, there are subtleties in it that you only understand if you've watched it a lot. Mm -hmm. You you don't actually understand how difficult it is. Um, what is helpful when we're watching the skating is the commentators are it, describing, oh, this is a really difficult, and, and then sometimes you see they don't make it. Even right. though they've made it through all their rehearsals, they've, they've made the 
you know, the jump. And trickle. then and then under the pressure, they don't, you right. know. Um, well, there are a lot of steps like that in ballet, too, that, but only people who know ballet and do ballet can actually understand how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not supposed to look difficult. That's the art form. Um, you, you keep smiling and you keep in character and then you attempt something really, really difficult that you know you could very well end up on your behind just like they do. And sometimes on this, do. And sometimes do. Yeah. <laughs> we all have done that. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's, I guess it's the commercialism of sport that allows them to be paid better and to have a much more commercial career than, than uh, performers in, in these kind of strict disciplines. Right. I, it, it, you do make it look easy. Well, right. that's part Smiling. of it. Yeah. Smiling. You can't even see the chest moving when you know there's great gulps of air coming in to be able to do the next yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, you're not allowed to show. I mean, I watch the, the strain and the effort in the athletes, and they're allowed to do that. They're allowed mm -hmm. to look. But a dancer has to have the same mental concentration but not show the, the kind of the effort involved. Right. Well, I know the sacrifice is immense in terms of, you know, work-life balance, which is an extreme sport, as we know, um, but also the physicality of it. I mean, you, we see online the, the f photographs of dancers' feet, right? It's just like, oh, <laughs> do your feet hurt all the time? Um, no. No? No, but anymore. they did when I was dancing on my toes, mm. but that was such a long time ago. Uh, no, I mean, I do have uh, some ramifications of a very physical difficult lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have, you know, arthritis and various things. But um, no, uh, my feet don't hurt. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> that good, because I yeah. know you love shoes. So that's I do. Really I can't cool. wear high heels for yeah. long periods of time. Mm -hmm. but I, I think, Oh, who can? Who cares? Really? Yeah, really. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question for you that I don't know the answer to, mm -hmm. which is how do you become, I mean, you start off in the core, then you're a principal dancer, if we're lucky, and then you're a prima ballerina. How, what happens in that transition? Are you, you secretly knighted somewhere? How do you become <laughs> the prima ballerina? That, it actually doesn't exist. I mean, oh. it's something that you don't, it's not, it's not in your contract. It's something that people may start to call you or may decide that you are. And, you know, with, with artists, as with in anything, they're, they're Everyone has their favorites, and everyone decides who's this and who's that. Mm -hmm. But um, in our world, you're a court of ballet, or you're a soloist, or you're a principal. And there's no designation prima ballerina. Huh. That's some, some, sometimes ballerinas like to call themselves prima ballerinas, right. but those are not, that is not cool in this day and age. That really isn't. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there, a secret revealed. I had no idea. <laughs> When we think about um, careers and we think about transitions, and you've made a, a spectacular transition um, from principal dancer, prima ballerina actually, <laughs> to artistic director of the National Ballet, um, you didn't decide to go into character roles. You went pretty well straight there. Was that a, a, a large leap for you? I mean, it's, it's kind of left brain, right brain in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yes. It, it it very much is another part of your brain. But I did have the opportunity when James Kadelka was artistic director. He did invite me back as artistic associate and I did start to sit in on all the management meetings and the administrative meetings and sort of begin to understand all the complication on the other side of the organization. Um, it's still not my forte and not my favorite thing. I still, I still try to run the National Ballet of Canada as an artist would run the company. I mean, my dreams for the company are all about where are we going? How do I develop these great artists? How do I challenge them? How do I make the public have a really interesting, exciting time when they come to see us? Where is the company going? How can I keep this company, in, the presence of this company in our country and in our world ever present mm. though we, so we don't disappear, so we're not isolated? Um, it, those are my goals. I, I, I have all these experts around me who worry about the box office numbers, the fundraising goals, and I do my best to be part of that. Well, you help. You're a great public speaker. You're a great, you know, per brand, really, for the National Ballet. And I think that the strength of your brand has really helped 
you be an innovator. You know, very early in your tenure, I, I was noticing that you were making some very ballsy moves, you know, really? doing, what was well, I doing? Like, like innovations, right, with brand yeah. new Canadian <laughs> choreographies, where, which is tough, right, because it's this a is tough sell. Mm -hmm. It's a tough sell. But, but um, Celia Franco was already, you know, I have learned from every artistic director before me because I've worked under every artistic director of the National Ballet of Canada. Mm -hmm. Celia Franca was bringing in, she was developing James Kadelka and Anne Ditchburn and choreographers from the early years. It, all of the directors of the company have tried to balance bringing in the world's greatest, most appreciated choreographers and developing young Canadian choreographers. It's part of what we exist to do. Sure, but there's more competition, I dare say, now in mm -hmm. order to attract sustainable, enduring young audiences to the ballet versus in those days, wouldn't you say? I think it's harder. It is harder. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the costs of everything we do just continue to rise and, uh, and it's really hard to keep our revenue meeting our, uh, mm -hmm. the, the rising needs, costs. Yeah. And, and that, that's scary, but we keep managing and we, you know, we just plug along and <laughs> so far so good. <laughs> and hopefully no snowstorms during the Nutcracker and we'll yeah, all be fine. Yeah, but people came yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. People came, thank goodness. Well, that's because yeah. you changed the policy that, you know, you, there's no new, you don't get a new ticket if you didn't make this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't but afford to, to do, do that. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what's it like, I mean, you're one of very few female artistic directors around the world. Um, where do you get support for what you do when, Given that it's a very female-oriented art form in many ways, a lot more lady ballerinas than there are men, where do you get support for what you're doing? Is there a, a club? Yeah, <laughs> there's a very small club of, mm -hmm. of female artistic directors. Um, and, and I did get uh, Monica Mason, who ran the Royal Ballet in London for a number of years, was very supportive. And, and I'm quite friendly with Brigitte Lefebvre, who's run the Paris Opera Ballet for 20 years. She's going to retire soon. Um, and we did feel, I think, like a very small club. But it is changing. I mean, Dominique Dumais is, is r a part of running a company in Germany, a Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, Tall, leggy Dominique. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, Tamara Rojo uh, is now uh, directing English National Ballet. So the club is getting a little bigger. Mm -hmm. Times are changing. but. Um, traditionally has been men who've run ballet companies, mm -hmm. mostly. It's yeah. interesting because I think, I mean, the, it's changed for young dancers as well. I mean, I remember, you know, the movies like Billy Elliot, Billy Elliot for, mm -hmm. for example, and, mm -hmm. and Baryshnikov and Nureyev kind of aside. Typically, if you were a young male dancer, everyone assumed you were gay, which is yeah. not really the assumption so much anymore. I yeah. hope not, yeah. because that's really a cliche. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I hope I hope that's changed. Right, yeah. and the, and as you said, the, the physicality of the dancers is 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 different now. I think they are just like athletes. They push harder. They go longer. The demands of the choreography is 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 much greater, mm -hmm. and um, we see it happening everywhere. I mean, that doesn't mean that we don't love sometimes to have some of the ballets from the past. For instance, um, we're doing Month in the Country now based mm -hmm. on the Turgenev play, which we have, the National Ballet hasn't done for 17 or 18 years. And it really is all about the storytelling and the, the poetry and the delicacy of the movement and the characters and the, the story unfolding. And it's quite dramatic mm -hmm. and maybe even a little melodramatic in a delightful way. Um, and it's a, it's a whiff of the past, it's a taste of the past, and it has to be done so beautifully or it doesn't work anymore. Mm. Um, but then you, you juxtapose it with something more contemporary, so the audience gets a taste of, of right. both. Well, you've got Swan Lake this season. Swan Lake, and, and this I version of Swan Lake. I saw you dance your last Swan Lake. I still remember it. Oh. I, yeah, oh, in yeah. that audience. I mean, that ovation went on for, I don't even know, I think they're still clapping. It was Actually. so long ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I didn't dance this version of Swan Lake. And this mm -hmm. version of Swan Lake is even more demanding physically for, on, on not just the leads, but the entire company. Really? Yes. Why? And that's um, just the way James Kadelka decided to do it. Mm -hmm. He decided to make not just the principals and some of the soloists dance 
a lot and really physically, but to have the entire corps de ballet much more mm -hmm. physicalized. Right. So um, that's exciting, but it's also more difficult, and I have a lot of injuries at the moment mm. um, from this in extreme physicality. How do you keep, I mean, it's like running any company, really, when, you know, you always, you want everybody on your team to be on the A-team, right? And you don't always have everybody on the A-team. Mm -hmm. um, and when you don't, you're not like the NHL, you can't go wave money at people and get a first draft pick and bring them on in. How much of a juggle is that to, uh, to marry the right repertoire with the right uh, resources that you have mm -hmm. at your command? Um, it's, it's always a balancing act, and I'm always hoping that I can attract and keep the A-team because of the repertoire that I'm giving them to do. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes my choices are made to satisfy the box office demands. Sometimes my choices are made because I have a certain artist that deserves to perform a certain version of a certain ballet at a certain time in their career. Mm -hmm. And it's more, of a, it's more of a choice for them. And sometimes it's a choice to involve the whole company in exciting work with some new choreographer that everybody wants to work with. Um, there are a lot of things, but mainly I try to retain my talent by giving them exciting work. And, and touring, touring must and help retention. Touring, yeah. And touring, and touring, um, which is very difficult and very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are doing a lot of touring, thank goodness, because we have some vehicles that everyone wants to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to take advantage of this moment in time when we have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, when we have a brand new Romeo and Juliet that nobody's seen um, outside of Toronto. Right. We took it to London. We're now taking it to Los Angeles. So we, are, we have the calling card of interesting repertoire that every other company isn't doing mm. at the moment. And this is a chance for my artists to have international careers also because we are isolated in Toronto. People read about us. They think it's really interesting what we're doing. And I hope that that's what brings the A-team and keeps the A-team here. Well, how would you describe your brand outside of Canada? I mean, in Canada, your brand is massive and well regarded. Um, but when you go outside, when people think about the National Ballet of Canada, mm -hmm. how, how are we seen, mm -hmm. you think? I know it's well, hard for you to blow your own horn. <laughs> no, I, this has been a goal of mine because I felt we weren't, people had forgotten about us because we couldn't tour anymore and didn't tour anymore. And um, there are a lot of really exciting companies out there doing a lot of exciting work. And I thought uh, we have to change this. We have to not live in our isolated, protected mm -hmm. area. We have to show them what we're doing, show them the quality of our dancers and the quality of our repertoire. And uh, that's been a major goal of mine. And I. I think we're achieving it. I, I have dancers contacting me daily from all over the world mm. who want to come here. Yeah. Um, and I, I and can actually pick and choose. Wow, uh, good for you. Uh, yeah. Good for you. As much as the budget allows me to pick. Absolutely. Up. And then some <laughs> just land in your lap, like Svetlana, right? Yes, <laughs> yes from yeah, the that was that was yeah. it. That, that was special. Yeah. <laughs> and she's about to make her debut in this version of Swan Lake. Oh, I'm coming. <laughs> Good. Yes, very good, excited. Good. And we have the wonderful Evan McKee, mm -hmm. uh, who's Canadian, who is a principal dancer from Stuttgart, but he loves dancing with us, and we love having him, so he's right. coming too. What do you think about the, the gen, what's your, what's your view of the arts in Canada at the moment? Are, how, I mean, you know, you look at schools, and often if there's any cuts to happen, it's always to the arts first, mm -hmm. it seems. Um, are you, are you nervous for the arts in Canada at the moment? I'm always nervous for the arts in Canada, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. And it's not getting better. Um, there's more and more artistic activity, which is great. There's no more funding. Um, so, you know, the Canada Council's had to make hard choices about cutting some of the major organizations in the country, including us. And uh, I, you know, I guess I sort of thought that might happen sometime. I'm, I'm just sorry that, that, um, cultural institutions that have proven their excellence aren't protected in a way from that, but that's mm -hmm. the world we live in now. Um, no, I, it's always frightening. I'm always worried about the future, and especially big cultural institutions, because they can go in and out of favor. They can, they can you know, they have to keep themselves vital and alive every minute or they're no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. and, w and we fight to be relevant. And, and that's the biggest challenge, to stay relevant to um, the people that see us and want to see us. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. 
Does social media help? You have people tweeting? Yes. And yeah, yeah. Things? Social <laughs> media is great. It's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, we, we can open a program. And when we opened Chroma by Wayne McGregor, which is coming back next season, um, nobody had heard of it. Nobody would heard of him in Canada. And after the first show, social media sold out the rest of the week for us on with young people, word of mouth. So Fantastic. it's great. Yeah. Right. But you still really shouldn't do it in the theater. Like, no, they can do it in the intermission. Glaring. Exactly. <laughs> do it in the intermission. Okay. <laughs> How, um, given all the ballets you, you've performed, uh, do, you mm. have a, do you have a Pavlovian body memory? Like if you're shopping for Christmas and you hear the Nutcracker come on, what happens? Well, some music right away, I can remember all the steps. And, and I really sometimes have this argument with my husband because he puts on a on the radio and we're driving somewhere and it's the potion scene from Romeo and Juliet and it, it brings back the emotional memory of where I had to go as an actress to do the potion scene in Romeo and Juliet and I can't listen to it I get I get emotional I get stressed it's just you know I, I was um, those things have such a deep internal memories um, and my feet, I sort of can remember the choreography, but it's more the emotional thing that I feel mm -hmm. uh, with certain music because I went there so many times. It's like Pavlova, you know, the, yeah. the instinct comes <laughs> yeah. right back. Um, but I am much more able to watch ballets that I did now, and I've deconditioned myself to having a em too emotional a response to them right. so that I can be more objective in what I'm looking at. Right. I imagine it's h hard not to be perfectionist, really judgmental as well. Uh, well, yes, I mean, but mm. you know, I, I am a perfectionist, but I also try to be um, understanding of it because I wasn't anywhere near perfect to myself. And uh, so, I, I, but I am, I mean, that is my nature and that's how I did as well as I did. Um, but I do have to keep it in check. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be great, right? Unless you push yourself like that. Mm -hmm. But I remember you, you being such a, a wonderful emotional dancer. And it, was that part of what the magic was with you and Nuria, for example? Mm. Yeah. Well, for me, I was never a highly technically accomplished dancer. I was just someone who could um, go someplace emotional with the music. The music mm -hmm. for me was was everything and it didn't matter what kind of music contemporary music well, you know I, I loved it all and that's what made me dance and that was the only reason I ever danced mm. um, so um, that I guess that was my best quality and I loved I loved acting I loved immersing myself in a character mm. uh, because it took away my shyness it took away my uh, self-consciousness it took away my judgment of what I was right. doing and I could just become a character and for me that was the most satisfying part of mm. dancing mm. you mu it must be difficult to gain the amount of self confidence y you need to be able to take on these challenges was was confidence part of the what you needed to reach for well you know when it was hard was when I started to get a, a reputation and people started to have high expectations and then that was very difficult for me in fact I, I quit dancing for a year because I couldn't take the pressure of the expectation because I didn't know if I could deliver on that expectation and and so my heart goes out to these Olympic athletes, especially the ones that have a gold and are going for it again and, you know, and mm. don't want to be humiliated or whatever, you know, and, and it's, um, it, the expectation can be really brutal for people. Mm. If you come in and nobody knows who you are and you do really well, it's, it's easier than people expecting you to hit a mark that mm. you know some days you can and some days you can't. Well, so. what was it like dancing with Nuria then? Because that expectation would have been right up there. He, he would insist that we would be emotionally involved dancing together. And then I could forget it all. And, uh, and I was too tall for him. And he didn't care. He said, I made him dance bigger. And he just said, you just keep looking me in the eye. And then it was fine. Then it w all the pressure went away and we created something between us that was important to, mm -hmm. to the audience. And uh, he, that was one of the biggest lessons he taught me. He, did he introduce you to Warhol? Warhol has done a painting of you, which yes, I was... Yes, he did introduce me. He was a friend of Andy Warhol, and, and uh, he introduced him to me at the Met in New York after performance, and 
Yes. Yeah. Where is that painting? Do you have it? Well, I have one of the silk screens. Oh. Uh, I believe there's four oils that the Art Gallery of Ontario has somewhere in their archives. Um, and there were 200 silk screens. So there were, there's a number of them around. Oh, so you can still get them. Get them, <laughs> while, you're, get them while they're hot. Yeah. <laughs> so 2017 is coming up. Canada will be 150 years old. Uh, what do you think we should be celebrating? And what do you think we should be working harder at as a country at 150 years old? Hmm. Well, we obviously should be celebrating the artistic community in mm -hmm. our country yeah. uh, and our athletes and all of those people that make us proud in the world. Um, there's so many accomplishments. Uh, I don't know. I, I just, it's a great country. Mm. Uh, I'm proud of our country and not just because we're in the middle of the Olympics, but in so many ways. Mm. Um, what was the rest of the question? That was kind of the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what could we work harder at as well? You know, when you, when you get distressed about who we are, mm -hmm. how we're seen, um, how we're treated, you know, are, are there things that you think we, should, we, should, we could be doing better and we could, you know, reimagine as we go forward into the next mm -hmm. on our way to 200? You know, I do, I, I admit I get so immersed in, in my wanting to make the National Ballet of Canada the very best it can be and to keep it there and it's a constant effort and I get a little bit tunnel visioned. Um, I guess I wish um, our country would, I know they celebrate our artists, French and English, in, in Ottawa, but I don't feel that it's something that's kind of Canada-wide. I don't feel that it's something that, that everyone knows about. Um, I, I wish that were more important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we're doing a better job of celebrating our athletes and we're more aware of what they do and how they do because we had the Vancouver Olympics and now we've followed people into, mm -hmm. but we should keep up the funding for those athletes too because it really, I think it really unites our country when we watch the Olympics and we're doing well and oh. we, we're competing with the best in the world and I feel the same way about the arts. I mean. We have that in our writers. Our writers are internationally known, um, but that's an art form that's a little bit easier to disseminate and to celebrate mm -hmm. uh, than, than big cultural institutions. Right. But, um, and, yeah. and civilizations are defined by their cultures at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. You made a fantastic transition from dancer to, um, we were head of the Canada Council for a few years, and good work there. I know you got the Thank funding you. up. Um, and also, and now as art artistic director. Um, and you also founded the Dancers Transition Center. Take me inside that. When, when a dancer who has to retire relatively early, comparatively mm -hmm. speaking, because the body just can't deal anymore, what's that like? Well, the, the whole purpose of the Dancer Transition Resource Center was to try to equip dancers before that came before mm -hmm. that moment when they had to let go of the thing they most loved in their lives, and uh, it's working very well. It's o it's o over 25 years old now. I was the founding chair of the mm -hmm. board, and uh, Joy Sansedim has really, really, really instigated it. But um, it's just to help them prepare themselves mentally and emotionally for the time when they when their bodies would not be able to do what what they do every day. And uh, so now they take skills courses and they think about it and they plan. And when the day actually comes, they can get psychological counseling, they can get um, um, career counseling so they can figure out what else they could do. Because there's a lot of life left mm -hmm. after you can't dance anymore. And you need to prepare yourself in many ways. But still, it's still a very hard transition. No, mu no matter how much preparation you have, it's still a very difficult time in your life. You have to go through a sort of grieving process to, mm -hmm. to become something other than a, a performer in mm -hmm. ballet. Mm -hmm. but, so it, it, yes, I'm proud of the work they do. I'm not so involved with them anymore, but I'm very proud of the work they mm -hmm. do. Well, a lot of uh, uh, our audience are reinventing themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're, they're retiring, but they don't want to retire, and they still have much to make uh, in, t in terms of contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting to see what happens, especially if it's forced upon you a little 20 years before you're ready for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, I see dancers who have become everything from medical doctors to chefs to uh, physiotherapists to you know and they're and they're happy and they 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 feel that they're contributing still that's the thing we all have to feel that we're contributing 
Mm. What a, when you think, and I bet you don't think about your legacy very often, but if you had to think about your legacy, were there moments uh, when you look back that you would think, these are defining moments for me, these are the moments that I, uh, of which I'm most proud? Um, well, there, you know, there were times in my career where I came to the attention of Canadians for various reasons, and I guess the most important one was um, winning a medal in Moscow way back in 73 mm -hmm. with Frank Augustine, where Canadians kind of didn't even know about Frank and I, and that was yeah. the thing. Um, I guess um, the legacy is that we can produce artists uh, in the ballet world of a caliber that we can all be proud of, and, and that sort of Canadians noticed that, not that they hadn't before, but maybe on a bigger scale because people were writing about it, talking about it. Um, but I, what I really hope my legacy is, um, is leaving the National Ballet of Canada in, um, in really strong shape for the future and something that will be protected and will be appreciated mm. in an ongoing way, even after I've gone. But you're not thinking about leaving anytime soon. Well, I'm not thinking about it anytime soon, but, mm. you know, we all have to retire <laughs> someday. <laughs> have, they, have they made any improvements in those ballet slippers yet? Are you still putting cotton batten into the no. wood in the... Uh, well, it, it's not wood. It's, it's okay. layers of glue and canvas oh, hardened in an oven. It's extremely very comfortable. comfortable yeah. What, what the, pro the progress has been made in the w what you can put on your toes to protect them from the pressure. Yeah. And there are fabulous things that I wish I'd had when I was dancing. The one I love the most is a, like a gel that is made for burns and things, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a little bit expensive, but we buy it in bulk yeah. <laughs> uh, for the dancers, uh, where they, they tape it on their toes, on, on each nail, and then the pressure, you can dance for hours without the pressure being right into your joints and into your nails. Really? So you don't get bruised toenails, which are excruciating. Mm. Um, so that was a lo second skin. It's called second skin. You can buy it in drugstores and really? stuff, or you can buy big things of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have that. And I think I remember near the end of my career, it, we were using it, and it was a revelation. I could dance for hours longer on point without the pressure banging my toes, because wow. that, that is painful. How do you manage your stress now? You're not dancing the way you used to be, so you can't take it out physically. Mm -hmm. um, what's your regimen? What, how do you stay in shape? Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's funny you should ask, because mm -hmm. that's the hardest part of my job, is the stress. Because I just worry about everything. I'm a worrier. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, and a warrior, but mm -hmm. more a worrier. Um, I try to do Pilates. I try to get enough sleep. If I get enough sleep, I'm much calmer and better, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's impossible because we have late nights, we have early mornings. Um, yeah, the stress is the worst. Physical exercise is the best for stress. And when I can get out for long walks or get to Pilates or whatever it takes, I feel better and I can deal with things better. It's really hard for me to fit that in, and sometimes I have to make the choice between Pilates, sleep, Pilates, sleep. And right. <laughs> it's a hard one for I me. I love my sleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, continued success, Karen. Thank I, you. I know, you know, Thank you. it's hard to believe, but you, I think, because you couldn't be as good a dancer as you are, but you're as good as an artistic director, which Aww. is really scaling some heights. So thank you and Aww. continued success. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>